Okay. Hello, friends. I am Rashmi Poradas, a freelance writer settled in the suburbs of Atlanta. I hope you all are doing well. You must have often uh, heard a quote that is credited to Heraclitus, and it goes something like this. The only thing that is constant is change. And today, in this episode of the conversation, we have a small change. Uh, diversity and acceptance define Dr. Ardin is my show. He has invited authors from all over the world. His guests are from almost every continent, I would say. And he has interviewed accomplished authors, film directors, producers, and even first timers, giving them a platform to share their stories. So I thought, why not change the gears a bit uh, for this episode of the conversation okay. and interview Dr. Isma on his fantastic novel, Bittersweet Memories of Last Spring. I read this book and it gripped my interest from the very first chapter and I have so many questions to ask you. Wow. So, viewers, join us as we talk about this fabulous novel. And okay. Dr. Isma, welcome to your own show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Actually, you know, I have so many questions to ask you. I'm just a little afraid that I do not give out too many details of the story. Okay. But uh, we'll before we... It. Uh -huh. You should stop me. So before <laughs> we get started, uh, for our viewers, can you just give a, you know, a brief outline of the story so that I can proceed to ask the questions? Right. Uh... It's a story of a young man, 17 year old refugee, who came to the United States under, you know, very uh, difficult condition. And he was able to navigate uh, through sometimes unforgiving streets of Miami. And uh, with the support of his family, especially his, his uh, sister. So graduate from the graduates from from college and ultimately you know try to make a you know uh pursue uh the same thing we all pursuing as immigrants into this country which is the american dream but of course in the process as a young man he, uh you know uh it, it's what, what's what's so interesting because it, it the story is written in the first person so the protagonist actually tells the story. So a story of a young man. There always there's always gonna be some detour and where he finds love, and that can sometimes come pretty dramatic. So <laughs> this is in essence the story of Irvin Lacroix, a young Haitian refugee arriving into the United States when he was 17. Okay. What happened is after I read your book, I came across a tweet by screenwriter and author himself, uh, Gabriel Constan. He wrote the screenplay for The Last Conception. And this is what he said. Even though I didn't have the same experiences as the characters in this novel, I could identify with them on every page. And I totally agree with Gabrielle because after I read the book, I felt as though I knew the protagonist and he lived in my neighborhood. He seems so real. And although I know that this is a work of fiction, you know, I keep on thinking, oh, he seems so real. So my question is that by any chance, do you happen to meet someone like Irvin, like, you know, or does anyone have any resemblance to this character? Because he seems very real to me. You say that, of course, it's a fictional story, but also, Rashmi, you know, fiction reflects reality. And that's, I think that's why most of us, if not all of us, mm -hmm. uh, relate to this young man. To see him, you know, to different stages of his life. Yes, of course, I can proudly say that this young man has some reflection of my own experiences growing up in 
in Miami. I came to the United States when I was 18, in this case, 17. Mm -hmm. And of course, I came in also in a boat. I didn't come to the United States um, in a plane. So I was able to capture this moment, this world is on a high seat, among the strangers that you don't know. So in a sense, I was writing my own story when I was writing those lines. So Beautiful. that's the reason why so many of my friends and strangers who have read the story tend to relate to it. So I, I, I wrote that from the bottom of my heart. You could see a lot of emotion in the song. Story. Correct. Absolutely. And uh, do you believe, like, since it's, as you mentioned yourself, the first person narration, does it help a lot? Because uh, I have not ventured too much into fiction writing, but whenever I write a story, I feel that if I write it in the first person, I literally get inside the character. So do you feel a first person narration always helps to you know, put your whole soul into writing a story. Yeah, yes, at least in my case, writing this story, that's how I felt throughout the whole narrative, uh, the whole process. Right. Uh, because uh, for the same reason that I just said, mm -hmm. uh, it has, you know, it's, it reflects my own struggles trying to immerse into a new society, into a foreign right. land. And it, it was always a constant struggle of acceptance struggle to learn a new language, struggle to new culture, struggle to blend into society. Because I never wanted to be, uh, to remain on the fringe of society. And I thought that the only way to uh, conquer mm -hmm. such elusive dream was through education. So, and this story also, the character, you know, he was adamant. He would not compromise, yes. you know, his, you know, the pers his pursuit for higher education. Yes. Now, uh, many factors have played a role in, uh, you know, shaping this beautiful piece of work. And one of it is the immigrant struggle, which personally appealed to me a lot. And I think this is a book that I read from right from the front cover till the back. And uh, you uh, dedicated this book to your family, correct? Right. And there is one line that you wrote to my sister, to your sister, you dedicated to her, to along with your parents and your uh, wife and children. And you wrote about your sister. We had nothing, but we had each other, like as an immigrant in the United States. And that line literally touched my heart because I came to the United States in my early 20s. We did not have a family, my husband and I, so it's, you know, I could somehow relate to that line so much because we did not have anyone, my husband and I, we just had each other. And as I was reading the story of the protagonist, Irvin, he had so many challenges, you know, uh, before him, he had to manage the finances. He had to make sure that he has a good GPA, GPA to graduate. And he also has a commendable work ethics. And one thing I liked about it, when Irvin mentioned that his mom said, nothing came easy in life. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think every immigrant who comes to this country or to any other country for that purpose can, you know, relate to them because he or she has to carve a niche to establish, uh, you know, uh, themselves, uh, you know, in the particular country. Right. We have this question. Every immigrant faces a struggle to carve an identity. Right. And by facing the struggles, he or she becomes stronger. That That is without doubt. Exactly. But, do you, but do you think that a person in the course of fighting the war, fight, you know, uh, braving the struggles, also happens to be a more grateful person in life in the process because uh, you, once you achieve a certain level, you reflect back upon the struggles that you have faced and you happen to be more grateful and you, you know, you count your blessings. What do you think about that? Because being a strong person is one thing, 
being a grateful person is another do you think that you know for us as immigrants you know to a different country like we you know end up being more grateful for the blessings we get in life I what is why, it uh, you said it just like you hit the nail right on the uh on the head because the thing is you have to be grateful grateful for the welcoming uh despite the odds Mm -hmm. You have to be grateful to strangers you've met along the way. Who, you know, when you're about to fall, who have lent a, a hand to you. Right. To prevent that fall. Even in sometimes when you fall, you find the, help, the necessary help to rise from that fall. And you know what it says that what really makes uh, a strong character of an individual it's not the fact that you never fall, but it is because of your ability to rise each time you fall. So each time you fall, each, each time you run into a major roadblock and you have managed to overcome that, then you become a stronger person. I totally agree. That is a beautiful answer. Uh, okay, let's go to Irvin's mistakes. He <laughs> struggles with his emotions and love all the time <laughs> and he commits mistakes and that makes him human. <laughs> but at least for me, when I read the book, uh, I know that Irwin is a flawed character, but you know, you did not end up disliking him. You did not judge him. At least I did not judge him. And in your book, as I look through, there are several instances where you mention about forgiving and forgiveness. And if you remember, last November, you and I had a chat on my book and I had dedicated, uh, you know, a section of the book, actually a chapter to forgiveness. Right. And you asked me a question. Now, when I read this book, of yours, I know where the question came from. <laughs> so uh, let me read from the book okay. and I'm not uh, going to give the context of who said it so that you know those who have not read the book will not get a clue. Right. But this is what is said. Love hurts and I find it hard to believe that I still love you. I never thought one heart could love and hate the same person at the same time. So now I'm, you know, just asking the same question that you asked me in my interview. So do you think one person can love and hate the same person at the same time? You know, there are some circumstances in which it can happen. And in this case, it happens. You know why love and hate can coexist sometimes? Because love uh, is so powerful, you know, and as an individual, when you so deep in the trench of a love that is trying to uh, escape, you sometimes can become very angry and that's when the hate comes, you know, that struggle, that fight to reconquer that love or maybe the fight or the res resignation what do you call that? A vanquish love, a love that can never be retrieved. So you yeah. become angry also. So love and hate, yes, can indeed coexist. <laughs> okay. And what about forgiveness? Like you have mentioned forgiveness so many times in your story. Uh, do you think that it is a very important segment of life for every individual to forgive and forget? And you know what? If you uh, do not subscribe yourself into this very important uh, belief that forgiveness is uh, beyond, above and beyond uh, everything when it comes to human interaction. Correct. And uh, you will always make mistakes in life. Right. Because we're human. We're not we are human. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, my mother always said, mm -hmm. if you're not prepared to forgive someone who's done some mis misdeeds to you in the past, then you are not ready to face life 
at its fullest. So what makes you stronger is the power, not just to say the word, but also to believe in it, to put your way behind it and say, I forgive right. you. Right. I totally agree. And even all our religious texts, they talk about forgiveness, you know, be it the Bible or, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, they all talk about forgiveness, that it is so important to allow forgiveness to others. Okay. Uh, another thing that I was, I really, uh, you, you know, I enjoyed reading because that equally seemed very real to me, the political backdrop in the novel, because you know, you talk, you know, talk about the protests in Miami against the dictator regime of Devalia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you were present in Miami, when you came to this country as a young man, I... uh, you know, you faced, you know, you faced, you, uh, you know, whatever was going on in your country. Your heart bleeds for your countrymen. So, uh, can you please share? Uh, what you went through your, from your personal experience at that time. Right. So when I was in Haiti, mm -hmm. I was very young. I was still a teenager. So in those uh, conservative countries, so parents really uh, tend to be very, you know, they're omnipresent. They, they have a stronger role in protecting their children. So I didn't quite understand the nature or the statistic nature of the Duvalier dictatorship. Right. During that, when I came to the United States and I began to meet people mm -hmm. who been through uh, uh, a lot, they've been imprisoned, people whose relatives have been killed or disappeared. Right. right. So I began to understand the true reality because I was born with, within the Duvalier dictatorship. So uh, I understand also the concept of popular democracy. And what really helped me, there were two struggles going on in Miami. One to, uh, for uh, refugee rights, uh, just like it says in the book, the Haitian Refugee Center in the middle of Miami was at the center of this struggle. And there was a priest, very outspoken, charismatic, by the name Gerard Jean Just. He oh. was he was the leader who he was leading the, the struggle against immigration officials with, with an army of lawyers to protect the refugees, myself included. So uh, another uh, another word, it was my own struggle. I was right in the middle of it. And also parallel to that is a struggle for uh, the I'm not gonna say restoration because Haiti really contemporary history has never had, you know, some sort of a uh, democratic governance and say. But that struggle was to help the people in Haiti understand or to support them in, in their own struggle against the regime in Haiti, which was a very brutal regime. So I really enjoyed those moments in there's a section, there's a, there's a passage in the story where uh, Irvin finds himself in the middle of uh, facing uh, cops, very stone-faced cops. Yes. Along yes. with the preacher. So, and that's just he was me. <laughs> and when he was jumping, he was thinking of his girlfriend, of course, but his mom also and his sister didn't know what was going on, but he did it anyway. It was a daring move. He didn't realize that he was the one indeed who did that. And that's how I felt also at that moment. Yeah. So remember that when the pastor said, you know what? We're not going to be cowed by these police officers. We are going to jump over the barricade and facing them right there. I look at that freaked out because, you know, I saw these people with, with the shiny, the, you know, the guns were very shiny. And then, <laughs> yeah, the face were hardened. So, I was waiting, you know, there were, there, there, were, there were people around me, but we were not very, it wasn't really a large group. There was a very, very small group by comparison of the large demonstration that used to have be held on there in 54th Street. So we were small and I think that police officers realized that we were small. So they thought this was a group that could easily be contained. 
So when the pastor said, I'm going to count to five, okay? <laughs> and after five, we're going to jump. I thought he was crazy. So he went one, two, three, four, and five. He was the first one to jump over the bike cat. And everybody followed him, including me. <laughs> you know, but that's the way it's described in the story also. Right. So they managed to hold the ground and other people from the neighborhood also came in. You know, we enforced that and the cops to just retreat it. So he was a victim. <laughs> So you basically, you know, you relived that experience once again when you were writing the story. I can tell that. Yeah, yeah, I could see it vividly. Yeah, right. <laughs> the the Haitian culture it comes like alive in your novel. Uh, you mention the music, the food, and you know, uh, I can relate to that because. Uh, I had I came to this country 30 years ago, but I'm still uh, very attached to my culture, to my heritage. Like you know, I say that you know you can take me out of India, but you cannot take India out of me. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's very classical. I and like then that. there is a line. Let me see if it, if I can find it. Yes. So in one of the chapters, this is what you uh, you know what Irwin says. Mm -hmm. The little Haiti environment in which I was living was far less unfriendly than other communities. That may have saved my Haitian roots, keeping me from totally becoming Americanized. So, uh, did you intend uh, to make Irvin a character who is very loyal or connected to his roots? and who keeps his identity intact of being a Haitian. Was it like, did you want to do that when you started writing a book? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, the idea of writing the story itself came from my own children. They wanted to, because we, we, we talked about Haiti all the time in the house. They know they are Haitian Americans. Right. But too often, um, immigrant parents they do not explain to their children the pride behind, you know, the, maybe the Indianism or the Haitianism, the Jamaicanism. Right. So when you ask those children, okay, what are you? My children would simply say, yeah, we are Haitian Americans. Mm -hmm. But why are you so proud of saying, uh, do you know, what do you know about Haiti and its history? You know, so that's when the whole conversation stopped. They know Haiti is located in the Caribbean. They right. know Haiti shares an island of the island of Hispaniola with another country that is called the Dominican Republic. They know Haiti was the first uh, black independent country in the Americas, the second only to the United States. They know, but they did not know the circumstances of, uh, they did not know the heroism that propelled slaves to rebel first and also to take up arms second, and then third to defeat the three most powerful colonial armies at the time. They okay. defeated the Spaniards, they mm -hmm. defeated the British, and they ultimately defeated Napoleon and declared themselves independent. So this is the story few people and the world can claim to be defeated simultaneously three major powers you're talking about a group of slaves literally uneducated but they know that they had each other and they would fight to the debt to achieve the ultimate which was freedom against slavery against the savagery of slavery and in doing so they had to teach the world that, yes, indeed, slavery could be defeated. And that also came with it, the misery and the persecution of the new nation. Because the colonial powers, they, they, they forged alliance to make sure that the Haitian story would never be a successful story. You know, because in 1804, Haiti was that in the way system in the middle of a sea of hatred in a sea of crimes, you know, 
because the the most hideous, uh, the, the most I would say hideous form of human interaction is to one person to enslave another person. Yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. If you understand what colonialism can bring mm -hmm. to a people, yeah. yes. a conquered people, to subdue the mm -hmm. you know the the dignity of a person. So right. that and it was even worse when when you are enslaved, you, you just like you a property of a person. You're not really a person. So they managed to show the world that yes, indeed, the mightiest army of, of the, in the world at that time, which was Napoleon, was mm -hmm. soundly defeated in the end. And then they declared themselves. So it was it's a great story when you tell the children about that. Yes, and they become you know more you know, <laughs> it's sort of about the history is. Emotional. That's why my yeah. children. So, and they asked me to write a story that would reflect, in essence, something not just about Haiti, but also when I arrived in the United States, how it was for me to navigate, how was school, the school environment, you know, when I went to school and all that. So, of course, their university was was right. the school I went to when I graduated my undergrad. I did that also. Computers, oh, yeah. So you know. And, <laughs> and my personal take is that you know when I you know read your novel, at the end this is a feeling I had. You were not moralizing anywhere, but at the same time, you know some beautiful lessons came out of your novel. And what we learn once you know what I learned actually after reading this novel is that human values are universal you know the most important thing for someone is to be a good human being and it doesn't matter in which part of the world you live and uh, there let me read out these lines really appeal to me a lot uh, you were talking about when you know every time i say you let me say urban so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so Irvin, he, this is a very important line which says, by using in this ingenious means to make money of an already marginalized population was not part of my character. So that spoke so much about his honesty. So, you know, you appreciate his honesty so much yeah. that, you know, that he did not want to make money by unfair means. Mm -hmm. And then there was another part when he comes to the U.S. and then he sees a couple of uh, beggars, uh, ragged uh, men, and he gives them a dollar each. And this is what he says. I welcome their wishes, which felt like a spiritual gift. Marman always said feeding the poor brought you rewards in times of uncertainty. And that I can totally relate because that's also in our Indian culture that, you know, you need to help the poor. So, you know, we are in two different parts of the world, but, you know, there are certain values that unite us, that unite humanity. And I think at the end of the day, that is what matters, you know, it's kindness, empathy. And yeah. those are the messages that really came out of your novel. So, you. Uh, you know, so I, th I thought, you know, I should make a note of that and tell you that that is what I learned from your book. Thank tell you. us, Dr. Isma, when can we expect the sequel? Okay, so uh, that's the question everybody's been asking. Yes. Working hard to have it uh, to make it available uh, no later than December 15th, I would say. Just in time for the holiday. Just before the holidays, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a commitment. I'm committed to doing so. Right. Committed to keeping this word. Because my wife has been sneaking on me at night and trying because she, gets, she just kept waiting. And I said, you know what? In bed, we used to share some of the things. You didn't realize what it was. And now you want it all. I said, well, honey, you're just going to have to go to bed. Yes, I really, I want to know what happens to Irvin because, you know, I actually, I reread the last chapter, you know, trying to get some idea what might happen. And then I said, no, we have to, you know, patiently wait for the sequel. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> this, this one, uh, uh, patient author, it's, uh, he's, he says that, uh, 
human heart is, is such a complex thing. Correct. And, um, yeah, you do not expect someone to do right, right all the time. I'm not saying this, this is what's going to happen with Irvin, but sometimes, you know, uh, there can be great surprises, you know, out of someone. But I'm just going to leave it as that. And uh, yeah, because, you know, you can only feel for him after what he's been through to, right. to finally, you know, patch things up with his little girlfriend, mm -hmm. you know, this when he thought that he really has it in, in hands, you know, and that's when, boom, such a tragic turn take place. You know, it's, it could be uh, pretty hard to swallow. You know, just like in a blink of an eye, you find yourself that you're alone. I love the promo of your first installment. I think you should make another one before your sequel comes out because that was done beautifully. It's a very beautiful video, you know. Okay. That was done very nicely. I think we are almost uh, nearing time. And do you have time for one last question? If you have another people, well, you know. Yes. Uh, uh, I was actually intrigued because of all your chapters, you did not put a title for any of the chapters. There is one particular chapter where you had a subtitle saying graduation day. I so, did that purposely. I did it yes, purposely. What is the purpose behind that? Because, you know, to what the whole story, graduating mm -hmm. was the ultimate prize. Okay. You know, so I felt I had to bring that to the attention of a reader. You know, okay. This is what's so important. So many right. sacrifices the sister really has to do to yes. make sure that to bring about this moment. So right. I purpose to say, I'm just going to put graduation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But that, so, see, no, no, no. I like that. You, 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 you look to every little detail. <laughs> <laughs> Right there. That shows I really love the book. So for the viewers, Bittersweet Memories of Last Spring is a must read. And I can guarantee, you know, you will totally enjoy this book. So Dr. Isma, thank you so, so much for giving me the time and to talk to me about your beautiful, fabulous, fantastic novel. And I send you all my blessings and best wishes that you continue to write more stories in future. Thank you so and much and have I a I have to say day. thank you uh, for uh, you also taking the time to talk to me so meticulously. You know, details that I did not expect to come up in the conversation came up. So you really, you, you, you're showing to, to an audience what it means to be not just an avid reader, but also a very, a very focused reader and i like that and thank you so much again perhaps when the book two comes out you know we'll do it again oh absolutely absolutely thank you so much